What is happening guys, Cowboy here, and welcome to my essential guide for Sekiro. So having finished the game twice now, and getting all the walkthrough prep done, I decided to knock this video out before I did the 100% walkthrough. And the main goal of this video is going to be to go over the various things that I had wished I knew going through the game. Uh, things that overall will make your experience a lot smoother and make you just a lot better at the game. So. Uh, some obvious spoilers because we're going to be talking about various mechanics and whatnot that are in some cases late game oriented. We're going to be going through uh, a bunch of different skills, a bunch of different combat type stuff. You may see enemies that are more late game oriented. You may see areas that are more late game oriented, but I will try to keep uh, spoilers to a minimum. There's obviously going to be no story spoilers in this video, but anyway, let's kick it off. So the combat in Sekiro is the thing I believe most people are having trouble with. Uh, and that's because, especially coming from things like Bloodborne and Dark Souls, you're used to much more slow, methodical combat. Whereas in Sekiro, combat is almost like a dance. The Clash of the Blades is your beat, and it's all about executing your deflects and weaving in your attacks to just create this beautiful melody. And the more you get it down, the more you get that timing down. Almost just like playing an instrument, it starts to flow a whole hell of a lot better. And I think the best way to showcase this is going to be to show three different distinct fighting examples all with the same enemy. And this first fight here, I'm taking a very Dark Souls approach, if you will. I'm dodging attacks, I'm attacking, and I'm blocking. And ultimately, you'll see that I'm having a lot of trouble. You know, I'm already down to half my health, I'm trying to get in attacks, the enemy is hitting me back. And this is pretty standard for what I would expect from players that are just coming out of something like Dark Souls. The second example here is going to be more of a deflect-oriented combat. You can see I have the Makiri counter going on, deflecting the kick. Uh, I am deflecting just about every attack this enemy does, and while it's taking about the same amount of time, I'm taking a whole hell of a lot less damage, and you can see we already have the enemy executed. And for this last example, I want to show what happens when not only are you deflecting, but you're staying aggressive and you're working your attacks in. And already before I finished explaining it, we have dispatched this enemy, so you can really see just how different it is from the three different combat styles. And while there isn't any magical piece of advice that's going to make you good at the combat, uh, kind of how I said at the start, the best approach, in my opinion, is to think of this as a dance. You know, you're, you're playing a beat, you're looking for opportunities to attack, but most importantly, you're always staying open, waiting for a deflect if you can. And you should have a pretty clear grasp of this the more you play the game, but especially as you're fighting enemies, you'll notice sometimes an enemy uh, will deflect enough of your attacks, such as right when you see here, you know, we keep hitting this guy, and eventually he basically forces my attack off, putting me into a place where I have to deflect. And, you know, you want to keep your eyes out for opportunities like that. You want to constantly stay aggressive, and any opportunity that you can hit an enemy you want to take that opportunity, you know? I think a, a big thing a lot of people do wrong here is they wait too long, they back off. I know I was guilty of it, especially when I started. And to be honest, the number one thing in Sekiro, in my opinion, is aggression. As long as you stay aggressive, you can beat just about any foe. So next up, I want to take a moment to talk about skills and what skills I would consider to be the most important ones to pick up in the game. Skills are very much at the core of the Sekiro experience, and depending on what skills you do or don't pick up, you'll see major differences in how effective you are uh, gameplay-wise. So jumping right in, let's start with the Shinobi Arts, and the first one we're talking about is Makiri Counter. Now you can get this ability very early, and I would consider this to be a uh, baseline skill that you basically have to have to really see progress in the game. This is going to allow you to step down and counter out a thrust attack. Anytime one comes at you, you can counter out swords, spears, kicks, pretty much anything that's a thrust. And what makes this so incredibly amazing is not only is it easier to pull off than deflecting a thrust, but you can also upgrade it with Shinobi Eyes, which allows you to do a ton of posture damage with the Makiri counter. Just to put it into perspective, with the Shinobi Eyes upgrade, you can usually posture break enemies after countering just two thrusts, making it a very, very attractive skill to get. Uh, in this tree, I also suggest getting Suppressed Presence. Being that this is a game where you play as a shinobi and there's a huge stealth focus, this is going to help you a lot just going through the game. You'll find that you're able to sneak up on enemies and get death blows that otherwise you couldn't. Uh, in general, instances that you typically have to use a gotchin sugar for, you can get by with just suppressed presence. And when you have suppressed presence and you use a gotchin sugar on top of it, you'll find that you're basically invisible and you can do some of the most ridiculous stealth type style kills that you could even imagine. Uh, moving out from there up to the top of the tree, Breath of Life Light. Now, I would consider this to be the most important skill in the game from a progression perspective. 
Uh, this is going to allow you to get back vitality anytime you end up death blowing an enemy, and especially with the combat being so heavily focused around you getting death blows, whether via stealth or even through combat. You know, anytime you finish off an enemy in combat, you can death blow them if you want. This skill pays for itself a hundredfold over. Uh, you're getting back roughly 10 to 15% of your health bar anytime you get off a death blow. And what's so great about this is think of instances like Harada Estate where you gotta fight past a bunch of enemies to get to the boss. With this skill, by the time you're at the boss, you don't have one or two Gord heals left. You have all of your Gord heals left because you've been killing everybody with death blows. So needless to say, get this as soon as you possibly can. It's going to be a huge boon for you. Moving on into the prosthetic arts, uh, this tree is very useful overall, especially as you move towards late game, I'd almost go as far as saying picking up just about everything here is going to be helpful. Uh, but first off, let's talk about the grappling hook attack. This one is very cheap and you can get it very early. And what's nice about this is there are going to be a lot of enemies where you have to dodge out of the way and you can get back to them with the grappling hook. This is going to allow you to follow that up with a double slash, just adding even more fluidity into the combat. Moving on from there, all of these abilities help boost your prosthetics. The first one, Chasing Slice, allows you to go after a slice after you've done a shuriken, firecracker, or spear. Fang and Blade also allows a follow-up attack. Projected Force allows you to do a blast after the Umbrella and Finger Whistle. And lastly, Living Force allows a follow-up after Flame Vent and Divine Abduction. And what's so awesome about these abilities is up until you get these, your combat is very much attack deflect, attack deflect, attack deflect. And when you get these, your shinobi tools also work into that rotation in a very natural way. Whereas without them, you're more using your shinobi tools as the opportunity arises. You know, you see the enemy in the air, you try to throw out a shuriken. Uh, you see the enemy has some downtime, you try to light them on fire. But with this, you're hitting them with the flamethrower, and then you're enchanting your blade in flame, and then you're whacking away at them, making sure they get lit on fire. Uh, my personal favorite here is probably Fang and Blade, just because with the loaded axe, you're able to swing in the axe and then hit RB and do a follow-up where you flip and then slam down with both the sword and the axe, effectively breaking any shield you come across, and on top of that, doing a buttload of posture damage. Uh, also worth honorable mention here, I think, is both midair prosthetic tool and then midair combat arts. Um, while they're not as important, they will just you know further bolster your combat and make things that much easier. Uh, moving over into the Ashina arts, I would consider this to be the most important tree in the game. Uh, the only skill I think that is worth more than the skills in Ashina arts is uh, Breath of Light Life. So first off, we have Ichimonji, which is a combat art that allows you to just do one heavy-ass swing. And what's great about this is you're dealing a ton of posture damage, you're doing a chunk of regular damage, and most importantly, you're recovering your own posture. This can also be upgraded to a double version, which allows you to do a double tap. And this is so good, even late game, I find that you could be, you know, almost breaking on posture and doing this once will take your posture bar almost all the way back down to zero. On top of that, we have three of the most important passives in the game here. Uh, the first up, Descending Carp. This allows you to deal bonus damage to posture uh, for a few seconds anytime you've done a deflection. So basically it's your counterattack skill. You deflect, get in a hit, deflect, get in a hit, deflect, get in a hit. This is what's going to allow you to build up posture incredibly fast against bosses. And without it, you're gonna find yourself struggling a lot more than you would otherwise. To complement that, we have Ascending Carp. This just outright increases the posture damage you do on a successful deflection. This is another skill that I would very much consider kind of core. Um, with this ability, enemies that attack very fast, you're able to pretty much break them just through deflecting. Uh, just to name a couple, there's there's a guy you'll fight later on in Ashina Castle that has this like anime double slash type thing. With Ascending Carp and a perfect deflect, you fill up half his posture bar just deflecting two attacks. Uh, against the Centipede boss, for example, this thing that just goes whack, 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 and attacks you. If you have Ascending Carp, same thing. You just go deflect, 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 boom, death blow. It's that easy. Uh, the last thing we have here is Flowing Water, which is going to re reduce the amount of damage you take to your posture when being attacked by a sword. While not as important as Ascending and Descending Carp, it's still just a nice passive to pick up that'll make combat that much smoother. 
Temple Arts, I haven't messed around with too much, but I will say that some of the passives here are quite useful. In particular, these two right here will allow you to get uh, both more gold and more item drops. Uh, the combat abilities in the Temple Arts, I didn't really find all that appealing. Uh, the final one is a like flippy kick involving your sword. The damage just didn't really feel all that good to me, and I think the big problem with it is I felt like I was kind of vulnerable for a while. Uh, whereas using something like the Ichimonji, you're very much just bam bam. You're just getting in that damage and then you're back to where you could deflect. Uh, I found myself exposed for a while using this. But if you have extra points to spread around, the extra items and extra gold passives are worth getting. Though I would consider them more of a new game plus type thing. The last skill tree we have is Mushin Arts. And you unlock this pretty late in the game as long as you have unlocked... Uh, one Master Art, and out of the three Mushin Arts you can get, the only one I would honestly recommend here is going to be Empowered Mortal Draw. Uh, Shadowfall, while decent, just didn't really feel that good. You know, you rush in, you jump up, you do a little bit of damage, and it's cool and it's kind of flashy, but against bosses, I found that a lot of the time I was just getting hit in the face with a big attack trying to do this. And Spiral Cloud Passage, which sounds awesome, and you would expect it to be phenomenal, costing 9 points, Ultimately, I found it just didn't do much. I was actually really disappointed by this. Uh, Empowered Mortal Draw, on the other hand, is just a very solid pickup. Uh, once you get the Mortal Blade and you get access to the uh, Mortal Draw Combat Art, you'll see how effective that is. This is just a bigger buffer version of it. And what's great is the only thing you need to unlock this is Ashina Cross and then Living Force. And we're going to be working towards Living Force anyway. And Ashina Cross is actually a very solid ability to pick up when you're looking for just doing raw damage. So for this next part of the video, I want to take some time to talk about core combat mechanics, in particular the Makiri counter to stop thrust attacks and jumping over sweeps and bouncing off the head of enemies. Uh, so initially here, you'll notice that I am stopping a lot of these thrusts with just regular deflects. And I want you to keep a close eye on the posture gauge of the enemy, you know, how much we're able to build it up. And you'll notice I've deflected quite a few thrusts here, but the posture gauge hasn't quite hit broken, and it's gone as far as to the point where I've died. In this next example, instead of deflecting, we're going to be using the Makiri counter. And you can notice already massive, massive amount of posture damage too. With just two of those, we were able to put the enemy into a death blow state. And that's really why I suggest Makiri counter so heavily. You know, in the other example you saw us deflecting, 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 and nothing came of it. Here, it took two, and he was posture broken. As for jumping the sweep, we're going to mix things up with a different enemy, and the Perilous Sweep attack is one that I find a lot of people end up getting hit by, because you're so used to deflecting, you see it, you try to press something, nothing comes of it, and you end up getting booped for a ton of damage. And not only can you jump the sweep attack, but you can also vault off the head of the enemy for an extra bit of posture damage, or alternatively, you can get in a couple attacks after the jump if you're more just looking to deal raw damage. Uh, though it is a little bit harder to time against certain enemies, you can even jump off the head and then still get in your double aerial attack as well. It all depends on what you're fighting against something like this guy. It's not going to really make sense to do the, uh, the bounce off the head and then double attacks because I'm going to be up in the air. But against a larger, more monstrous enemy, it would be a great go-to move. But the big thing here, of course, is just that you want to be uh, aiming to either bounce off the head and build up poise if you're looking to get a death blow versus poise on a boss. If you're looking to uh, get that death blow via just breaking their health counter, it's going to be a lot more beneficial instead for you to just get in those attacks and not even worry about the bounce. So now I want to take a moment to talk about Resurrection in Sekiro and what the little icons by our health bar actually mean. So taking a closer look, we have three icons here, two of them being flower petals and one of them is more of a snowflake. The flower petals are resurrects that we have available from killing enemies as we proceed through the game. The flower petal is a resurrect that we have available from resting at an idol. Now initially you won't have two of the flower petal ones, you get a second one later in the game through various events. Uh, but the main gist is that you can refill one via killing enemies and the other one only refills from resting at an idol. Now what I want you to notice in particular here is that when I resurrect, there is now a black bar crossing them out. You notice the first res has vanished, I now have two available, but more importantly, that black bar means the resurrects are unavailable. Even if you die, even though you have two, you will not be able to resurrect. And the only way to get rid of that black bar is by performing a death blow. Now what's important to note here is you don't need to necessarily kill an enemy, you just need to do a death blow. And what's powerful about this is against a boss, you could go down 
get a death blow to go into the next phase and effectively have your resurrect available again for the second phase of a boss fight. Once again, as we rest at a shrine, you'll see the third one comes on back as well. Next, I want to talk about gold and keeping value as you play Sekiro. Now, when you die, you lose half of your resources, and that includes uh, skill points that haven't turned into an actual point, as well as half of whatever your gold currently is. Now, with skills, you can farm to hit a point threshold, and then you don't have to worry about losing it. Gold, you will still always lose half of what you have on death. And the best way to help counteract this is buying gold bags from merchants. There's a 10% upcharge, so 100 gold in a light coin purse will cost 110, but if you're going into a boss fight and you have 1,000 gold or so, you can effectively buy up gold bags, converting it into what's essentially banked storage. And then when you do need your gold to spend it, you can pop your gold bags and get it on back. And the last thing I want to talk about is being overwhelmed and knowing when it's time to retreat. Uh, I think a big thing coming from games like Dark Souls and Bloodborne is, you know, you, you see enemies and you're like, I gotta fight them all. You know, I gotta beat all these guys. That's part of this zone. And the most important thing, in my opinion, to remember about your Sekiro experience is you're a shinobi. You are a ninja. You're not meant to honorably fight 20 enemies at once. What ninja walks into a room and is like, I am here to kill you all? That doesn't happen, man. You have the rope. You have all kinds of ninja tools. You should be, you know, jumping up into trees, uh, looking for areas you can hide and re-stealth. Basically, you want to be the biggest whoremonger on the battlefield. You want to be picking people off one by one. You want to be stealthing up and killing people who are by themselves. Anything you can do to give yourself an advantage is okay in the Shinobi Guidebook. And that's a big thing I think a lot of people just need to come to terms with when playing this game. If you need to rope up into some trees and shoot across the battlefield and, and mix up your position so the enemies lose you, and then you go back in and start picking them off, that's perfectly fine. If you decide you get overwhelmed and you just want to jump away and pop your homeward idol to head on back to base, that's fine too. At the end of the day, this is a single player game, and the most important thing is that you enjoy your experience. You know, there, there's no PvP, and I, I know a big big part of this community is, you know, get good, you have to get good. But to be honest, you're not going to get good by fighting 10 enemies at once and getting your ass beat. At the end of the day, if you want to get good, you got to get in that ninja mindset, man. It's time to sneak around, it's time to look for opportunities, split them up, and pick them off one by one. And that's ultimately going to be the best thing. I found that I enjoyed Sekiro the most, not when I was fighting four or five enemies at once, it was when I was playing like this horse little ninja that was sneaking in and picking off two people and then running away and waiting till one rounds the corner and then killing him because he rushed in by himself. Get in that ninja mindset and you'll find that everything just flows oh so much better. But that's going to wrap things up for the Essential Guide. Hopefully after watching this you guys have learned some things that will help your experience in Sekiro and make things a little bit easier overall. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to leave them down in the comments, and I'll try and answer everything I can. But other than that, thanks for coming by. I hope you guys are enjoying the game as much as I am, and I'll see you later with the 100% walkthrough.